Hello and a warm welcome to Portfolio Watch. I'm Gugule Tumfupi and in today's program we take a look at the U.S. economy. Yep, given its size and its strength, we take a look at how the U.S. economy influences investors' decision, particularly identifying what makes us uncertain and what are the major players in unsettling the developments that we see in emerging markets. Well, to help us understand this topic a little bit further and take a look at potential stocks to consider, I'm joined in studio by Andrew Ditburner, Chief Investment Officer for Private Client Securities at Old Mutual Wealth, and Aileen Campbell, Chief Investment Officer at Advice Work. Ladies and gent, or lady and gent, welcome. Mm -hmm. Let's actually yeah. pick up with the US economy. And I think for a lot of us as investors, you think Trump and his tweets, you think the growth in the economy, <laughs> US non-farm payroll figures, and of course, rising interest rates there. Lots of elements to consider, all of which are actually working for the good of not only the US dollar, but the overall economic development of uh, the world's largest economy here. Yeah, sure. I think if you, you if you want any idea how the U.S. is doing, you can just look at the U.S. dollar. I mean, the U.S. dollar strength coming through at the moment is quite strong. Um, but you know, Trump talks about any any bases whole campaign on this "Make America Great Again." But yeah. all the points that you touch on, you know, America is doing really, really well at the moment. You know, they're reaching the longest um, economic recovery on records. I think next year is going to be 10 years, and that's now leading people to think, you know, when is this going to come to an end? Uh, you've got the S&P 500 that's just reached its longest bull market ever. Um, yet uh, Trump is saying we need to make America great again. Well, <laughs> sounds like <laughs> if you look at right the headlines, now. it looks pretty great at the moment. Um, and you've seen company results coming through as well. So, you know, I think it's almost a tale of two worlds. You think of developed markets versus emerging markets mm. and emerging markets are doing quite poorly at the moment. Or there's a lot of negative news and sentiment around uh, div emerging markets, you know. But then if you look at developed markets, it's really only the U.S. that's doing quite so well. So is you know, that if a you look Trump factor genuinely or is it just a matter of many of these macroeconomic uh, elements were coming together at the same time and working yeah, together so given I mean, his timing as I president? I right? suppose you could look at it in the uh, South African context, Ramaphosa. Is this a Ramaphosa issue that you're dealing with or is it legacy issues that have been coming on for, for many years and it might sure. be the same in the U.S.? We've had this quantitative easing. The U.S. has slowly been recovering for many years. I think Trump might like to believe it's him, but it's probably a longer term story. Yep. It started long before Trump was in office. Let's hope he'd be able to admit that in public, which <laughs> we doubt. But Aileen, what are your thoughts with regard to what we see in the US, given that we just can't ignore mm -hmm. uh, the influences that mm -hmm. this particular economy has on the global scale? So what's been good for the United States has not necessarily been good for emerging mm -hmm. markets. Mm -hmm. And you know, Andrew spoke about the strong dollar. And that has a significant impact for emerging markets, because what we've seen is because of the strong growth rates in the US, the Fed is now having to raise interest rates and rising interest rates are generally not good for emerging markets. And certainly what you see is portfolio outflows from South Africa back to the States because rates are rising. And we've seen that in South Africa. We've seen foreign sellers are not, uh, were net sellers of our bonds and our currency. So that's the first thing. And then secondly, it increases the cost of debt. Mm. So because of the global financial crisis resulted in very low interest rates, you had lots of emerging markets raising huge amounts of debt in um, US dollars. And with, the rate, with rates going up now, that obviously increases potentially the cost of servicing that debt. So what we're seeing is a bit of a rout in emerging markets. It started in the second quarter of this year as rates have continued to rise in the States. And we're seeing problems in Turkey. We're seeing problems in Argentina. And unfortunately, we've been put in the same neighborhood as other bad emerging market currencies. Yeah. Although we live on a different street, you know, our monetary policy is a lot more sound. We don't have a lot of US denominated debt. Um, so unfortunately, they've caught a um, they've sneezed and we've caught a bit of a cold. Yeah, quite unfortunate. But of course, this adds to the uncertainty that we see with a lot of investors uh, and anxiety as to, okay, so where should I actually be allocating uh, a lot of my exposure to? When it comes to the dynamics of developed economies versus emerging markets, we've covered this previously, previously on uh, mm -hmm. other elements of the show, but where would you be looking right now, Aileen, given that, of course, your investment decisions are based on a long-term outlook? Sure. So if you look at it purely from a valuation perspective, emerging markets are actually looking very cheap now. I mean, we, we've seen a 20% contraction in emerging markets, um, you know, in terms of what's happened in the markets, equities. So from that perspective, they are actually looking quite good. But I'm worried about this wave of momentum that's going against emerging markets at the moment. Okay. So, um, and also the other thing we need to consider is trade. 
Um, so Trump and his trade wars, also not good for emerging markets because mm. it puts a dampener on sentiment. Um, and then people are worried about global economic activity. And that's why Europe and Japan and Southeast Asian economies have been a bit weaker over the last two quarters. So right now, I think I might stick with the S&P. Um, it is not that cheap, absolutely. Yeah. But if you look at corporate earnings, are still reasonably robust. Uh, we expect them to grow over the first um, couple of next qu couple of quarters. But I would certainly be looking for opportunities in emerging markets. And certainly if you look at South Africa, yes, the GDP growth numbers were absolutely dire. But if you look at, it, at us as from a valuation perspective, take NASPAS out, you know, we're trading at much cheaper valuations. Mm. So for the brave, you might want to start dipping your toe into some emerging markets, but be just conscious of this big wave yeah. at the moment that is not conducive to emerging markets. Andrew, would you agree, uh, uh, given the flow <laughs> and the environment right now, and of course from an equities perspective, uh, Aileen mm -hmm. certainly given us her view, but what about the fixed income space, uh, if that's even an element that we should be considering as well, given the, 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 the play there? Yeah, look, if I can maybe just touch on the emerging market sure. equity space first. I think, you know, if you look at emerging markets and you go back over history, you know, there are emerging market crises, mm -hmm. I mean, littered, you know, in the past. Every 10 years, there's an emerging market that defaults on its yeah. sovereign debt, you know, and you can go through and you can see, you know, that whilst there's a lot of volatility or this brings on a lot of volatility, over the long run, emerging markets actually do really well. And if you think about, you know, the economic world, you know, where the center of the world is, it's been shifting, you know, over a long period of time from the west towards the east. And this is predominantly because of emerging markets, the superpowers of Asia being India and China, and that's mm. going to continue. So if you think about emerging markets today, they make up over 60% of global GDP, and global GDP growth has been driven by emerging markets. So if you believe that economic growth drives corporate earnings, which in turn drives returns, you want to have exposure to emerging markets. But emerging markets only make up a very, very small portion of a global equity market. The US is still 55, 60%. Everyone loves going to the US. Um, you know, and you forget about the emerging markets. So I'm not saying go and, you know, stock up on your, or, you know, fill your portfolio with emerging market companies. You don't even have to do that. You can buy businesses that derive a lot of their earnings or sales from emerging markets. So I think emerging markets for me is still, whilst there's volatility, there's a lot of nervous, nervousness around, I think it's still a good or attractive investment proposition. Mm -hmm. um, you know, going to the, the sovereign debt, question that's probably slightly more you know and there's a lot of capital flows that are going to impact mm. that and as we've seen interest rates in developed markets pick up there's flows leaving um, emerging markets quite quickly and we've seen that in South Africa already mm -hmm. you know and then just if you just think about the RAND as well you know the RAND I think 17% of South Africa GDP or the value of South Africa GDP gets traded in the RAND daily sure. so when you've got these yeah. emerging market nervous nervousness mm -hmm. you know the RAND's a proxy for that and you've seen that coming through in the RAND so I think this on the sovereign side, it's probably slightly, you know, it's not as, uh, not, mm. let me not say a slam dunk, but <laughs> it's not as clear. Clearly, uh, tr treacherous waters mm. for us to uh, uh, manage, but of course, uh, there are some investment opportunities, and that's exactly what we'll get into by taking a look at some stocks that can give you the benefit of emerging market exposure. <laughs> The first one's a rather interesting one that we'll pick up with, and it's MTN. And given the recent news flow, boy, mm -hmm. have they had a lot of pressures, especially when it comes to Nigeria. And not only the repatriation of um, some of the uh, dividends that they took out, and the authorities there say it uh, was actually illegal, but also being slapped with the tax bill. And, of course, mm -hmm. the fine that they still need to settle from at least three years ago. I'm a little bit anxious about this one, right? Because we've also seen quite a significant sell-off in their share price, Andrew. Mm. So I think this probably highlights, you know, the risk of investing, I suppose, in an emerging market, um, the regulatory issues that, that come with it. And MTN has, you know, a fairly long history of problems in Nigeria, as, as we know. You know, so you always get nervous when a company uh, invests or operates in, in these geographies because you never know, you know, what's going to jump out of the closet on any given afternoon. Mm -hmm. And we saw that uh, over the last couple of weeks. You know, so MTN, I was listening to, to the CFO on the radio the other day, and they, you know, believe they haven't done anything wrong, but you would expect them to, to come out and say that. You know, but it highlights, you know, and if you think about all the companies that have come before that have tried to go to Nigeria or oh. gone to Nigeria and pulled out, you know, whether it's Nando's, Woolies, Trueworth, Mr. Sun International, Price, yeah. Telcoms, Mr. Price, you name it, they've all been there and they've all come back with their tail between their legs. 
And one also has to wonder about what the thinking is in Nigeria. You know, if you're trying to attract foreign investment, mm. this is not the way to go about it. And the Hollard CEO, you know, talking the other day, was asked the question, would you look at Nigeria? And he said they were looking at it or thinking of it or thinking about it. But now that's all being put on hold, given mm. what's, you know, so it's uh, MTN four years ago, $480 billion market cap. Today, it's $140 billion. If you take that $8 billion that they must take mm. back, sure, they're not asking to, it's not a fine, bring back the $8 billion. But Nigeria then are, are then going to give them the, the Naira equivalent exactly. of what they took it out at, which was, you know, whatever, 120 Naira to the US dollar versus mm. the 360 yeah. of it today. So they lose two thirds of it, essentially you know, plus the two billion payback. That's, mm -hmm. you know, you've got to wonder what the value in Nigeria is, you know, of that business. It's probably yeah, minus yeah. at the moment. And you've got to wonder how they actually came up with the numbers. Yeah. Exactly. You know, think about eight billion US dollars, but if you look at the market cap of NTN is 140 billion rand, um, they're asking for 120 billion rand in rand terms, and Nigeria only contributes, what, about a third to their earnings? Third, yeah. And their total net profit on their last trading statement was about three and a half billion. So how did they get to eight billion US dollars? One has to wonder. Um, and you know, so you're obviously operating, as Andrew said, in a very difficult environment where regulations and laws are very fluid and clearly open to interpretation because the Nigerian Senate has got a very different view of this relative to the Nigerian Central Bank. Mm. So you're not quite sure where you land. So, and that doesn't attract foreign investors, absolutely exactly. not. But I think Nigeria is too important to MTN in terms of earnings, in terms of subscribers, and the investment that they've made into the infrastructure for them to necessarily mm. pull out. Just before we do take a brief break, just uh, and wrapping it up with MTN and looking at the influence of the US, we also can't ignore Iran, right? Um, just a few years ago, um, the removal of the sanctions, mm. slapping them back on again, and that also has implications for MTN. So US clearly their fingers reaching, having <laughs> far reaching <laughs> implications, but is that another element we need to bear in mind before looking at MTN as in an investment opportunity here, Aileen? Yeah, I think what you need to think about, and as Andrew said earlier, the ability to repatriate money back to South Africa. So while this issue is happening, you will not be able to repatriate dividends back to South Africa. Mm -hmm. You've got, what, three or four billion rand stuck in Iran, which you can't repatriate back to South Africa either. So that puts pressure on your earnings, put pressure on your dividends. So that is something you have to think about as an investor. Am I being adequately compensated for the risk that's inherent in the geographies in which MTN operates? So are we buying MTN? I'm not buying MTN. <laughs> the, not even at these levels. looks cheaper. I think if it's you, just too if much If you're looking risk. for yield at 8.5%, yeah. sure. <laughs> then maybe it's but one yeah. got to, you know, you've got to ask the question, is that sustainable? Yeah. Uh, I think there's too, there's just too many question marks around there at the moment. I would be, you know, sitting on the sideline. I suppose in the long term, the truth's going to come out, you know, what the real story is. You're taking quite a big risk if you... If, if you're going in at the moment. Yeah, well, we've uh, certainly gotten the conversation going and uh, lots of anxiety regarding MTN, but continue to join our conversation on social media at CNBC Africa, hashtag Portfolio Watch, or send us your questions and suggestions to Portfolio Watch at abn360.com. Stay with us after the break. We take a look at stocks like Sunlam, Momentum, Quarter, and even the likes of First Rand. Welcome back to Portfolio Watch, where we're taking a look at investor uncertainty and a lot of that really stemming from the U.S. market and how they have an influence in unsettling dynamics in emerging markets. My guest in studio is uh, Andrew Ditburner, Chief Investment Officer for Private Client Securities at Old Mutual Wealth and Aileen Campbell, Chief Investment Officer at AdviceWorks. Now, we did touch on MTN as a stock and, of course, interesting dynamics there, influencing uh, uh, the position and the stance of many investors. But what about First Strand? Also recently came out with a solid set of numbers, uh, looking quite impressive. But, of course, we know they have exposure to markets like India, some parts of the African continent. Are, are you still optimistic about um, the growth <laughs> in this particular <laughs> banking brand? Yeah, so I think... You know, any bank, local bank, is going to be highly geared towards the local economy. Mm. And we obviously get the, the bad news last week that we're in a technical recession. Look, yeah. it shouldn't have been news to anyone because I think we've been in a recession, some commentators say, as long as 10 years. But if you're actually looking at GDP per mm. capita, which is a number I, th I believe you should be looking at, we've been in a recession since uh, the third quarter of 2015, so three years now. You know, and these you would expect 
these numbers to be coming through in, in some of the local facing companies, and, and they are in certain places. But first round, I think, actually had a really good result last week. Yeah. Um, I think the earnings were up about 8%. Um, that's obviously in nominal terms. When you're looking at GDP, you're looking in real terms. But that's still ahead of inflation, doing better than the economy. So I think they're actually doing quite well. The real standout was obviously FNB. I mean, FNB grew their earnings 16%, mm. um, which is a fantastic result. West Bank is battling. But that shouldn't be of a surprise when you think about the economy. New vehicle sales are down. Um, and West Bank's still a relatively small part. I think it's about 14% of the total business. Whereas FNB is, I think, about 56%. So FNB grown at 16%, mm. attracting new clients. You know, they're doing a really, really good job there. And when you compare it to the other banks, I think this was a standout performer. Um, mm. You know, from a results point of view, they are. You know, from if you look at their valuations, they are more expensive, but they probably deserve to be so. They're more profitable if you just look at their return on equity, for instance. It's well in excess of 20%, whereas all the other banks are below 20%. So you're probably paying up for for quality. We do hold this uh, this uh, share in our portfolios mm -hmm. and will continue to do so uh, given these, I suppose, strong set of results. I think where they've differentiated themselves relative to other brick and mortar banks is technology. Yeah. They've really mm. embraced mm. technology in the way they engage with clients and it allows them to cross sell a lot of different banking products um, and also to upsell as well. And they've just made the client experience so much more mm. um, Ex, you know, b a better client experience. If you think you can order your passports and vehicle licenses mm. on their app, which is fantastic. So I think they've really evolved that business. And I think you know, if you look at the earnings in FMB, it's it's a complete outlier compared mm. to what we've seen in in other banks. And what was interesting for me was a pickup in loan growth. Yes. So I don't know if that's a very early mm. indicator. But we saw similar um, results in ABSA. We're starting to see loan growth starting to pick up slowly but surely. So hopefully. That's a good sign of things to come. Mm -hmm. I want us to move on to, uh, to another financial services company, slightly different this time, and spun off from the old mutual group, given the mm -hmm. relisting that recently took place here in South Africa. But Qualter, and uh, maybe mm -hmm. not very familiar for those mm -hmm. who uh, aren't uh, akin to the name, but give us an understanding as to how the U.S. economy does influence uh, this particular asset management firm. Well, Qualter is more, uh, it's, it's a U.K.-based business. So it's obviously spun out of, of old mutual. And they play directly to the, the UK retail. It's a wealth and advice business with a platform that does administration. So if you as a, as a retail client can get access to numerous different you know, investment products, etc., and they do all the administration behind the platform and that. So it's a vertically integrated uh, business, mm -hmm. you know, offering advice. They've got asset management, they've got discretionary fund management, they've then got the administration through their platform. Um, which is very diverse if you com if you compare it to their peers in in the UK, your you know Bruin Dolphin, the St mm -hmm. James's Palace, etc. Um, so yeah, so it's an interesting one. It's a fairly unknown entity at this stage because this is the old old mutual wealth UK. So now called uh, called Quilter. Uh, so fairly unknown. We've we've seen their first set of results, which which looked fairly okay from a valuation point of view. They trade at, at valuations, you know, much more attractive than, than some of their peers. So I think, you know, this one needs a bit of time for the market to understand it. Uh, far more, you know, diverse, vertically in integrated, as I said, compared to its, its peers. So I think it's, it's, it's a fairly, offers an interesting proposition to investors. It's a 100% Rand hedge. Uh -huh. So if you're looking for Rand hedge, this is, but it's UK, so it's not a Should US. Should we be concerned exactly about the sluggish economic growth and pick up there in the UK, <laughs> right? So there's and a lot Brexit's of, still on yeah, the so there's obviously a lot of uncertainty, particularly around the whole Brexit story. Um, so Brexit, I think now the, Divorce agreement's been pushed out, I think, to November now, yeah. with D-Day being, the tw I think, the 29th of March yeah. next year. You know, this still perplexes me, this whole Brexit issue. You know, they want access to the, to the market, which they originally had, but they weren't really ever part of the UK, I mean, part of the, the yeah. EU, given that they had their own monetary policy, their own currency. Yeah. So they pulled that away, but now they want to get back in, mm. but on different terms. Break up, but with it's benefits. Uh, it's a bit of a yeah. mess, <laughs> exactly. It doesn't quite work out. We talk about the pressures in the economy, and of course, mm. we also bring it home to another company, um, Sunlam, that also mm. recently published earnings. Um, of course, significant exposure to the South African economy and um, some parts of the rest mm. of the continent. But Aileen, are, should we be anxious uh, about what we're seeing in the underlying numbers? 
members of this particular entity and its investment case essentially. So two companies released results, Momentum and Sunlam last yes. week and insurance companies a bit like banks are a good litmus test for the health of the economy and the health of the consumer and in both cases we have seen you know new business volumes are falling, um, we've seen policy lapse increases particularly in the case of Momentum and it really does demonstrate the pressure in the local economy and the pressure on the, on the consumer in terms of disposable income. So in terms of Sunlam results, yes, their top line revenue was down slightly by 7%, but they still managed to grow their earnings. So yes, it didn't shoot the lights out at 3%, but, and it's certainly well below inflation. But compare that to Momentum, where you saw a 12% fall in earnings. Mm. So I think a much better outcome for Sunlam relative to Momentum. Um, I think the striking feature at Momentum was the fall in the value of new business. It plummeted by 45%. So, and that's not a good indication because insurance companies use that as an indicator of the economic value of profits that will be derived from new business. So we've seen margins come down, we've seen volumes come down. So Hilly Mayer, who's been called back to momentum, he was yeah. the previous CEO, has been called back to try and resuscitate its fortunes together with their new executive team. So on a valuation basis, momentum's probably looking reasonably cheap. It's trading at a large discount to its embedded value, but it's whether or not Hilly Mayer and his team can actually turn the fortunes around at Metropolitan and momentum. Mm -hmm. Sunlam overall, the results, like I said, 3% increase in earnings, not great, but you know, we had pockets of really good returns. I think the emerging markets business has done reasonably well. Suntum had actually a very good um, reporting period because the claims, or short term claims, were relatively low um, in the first four months of this year. The weaker area was potentially Sunlum Investments um, because what happened there is in the investment cluster they had a large overweight position to Steinoff and we all know what's happened mm. to Steinoff lost 95% of its value. So in terms of its investment portfolios they had an above benchmark weight to Steinoff so that hurt. And then they weren't really positioned for the recovery we saw in equities at the end of last year. So they had very defensive portfolios, more RAND hedges, and they weren't able to capture to the same extent the recovery we saw in retailers and banks. Sure. So that hurt investment flows. But overall, not a bad set of trading results considering how difficult trading conditions are in South Africa. So clearly remaining very resilient and uh, sustaining the long-term growth or outlook, so we hope. But to tie it back to the U.S. influence, we know that Donald Trump also recently tweeted that he's a Secretary of State, is investigating the um, land expropriation issue in South mm -hmm. Africa. Naturally, we understand presidency is engaging on this particular case, mm -hmm. but for the banks, for the insurance companies that you alluded to, one would think, uh, uh, you know, is there a sense of anxiety uh, as to how they'll manage potential losses um, mm -hmm. given up uh, potential seizures on property now? Sure. So the banks have weighed in on this debate and said, you know, there would be enormous repercussions for the banking system mm -hmm. if farmers, for example, were to walk away from their farms, which, you know, for which they've got debt over those farms. Um, but I think the ANC is trying to work quite hard to differentiate their message. Um, which is to expropriate land um, without compensation but under very specific conditions. So sure. they're trying to bring clarity to an element of the constitution that might have been a bit grey. Mm -hmm. And to differentiate that from the EFF stance where South African government becomes the actual owner of the land and then you lease it mm -hmm. to, to the tenants. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's their intention to do that. So, but yes, unfortunately, Trump has weighed on in this issue with a lot of misinformation <laughs> as well. Yep. Um, but I think it's also put the pressure back on the ANC. They have to be clear in their messaging. And we also got to be aware of the fact that the Algoa trade agreement with the yes. United States is premised on the protection of property rights. So whilst we don't like to listen to Trump, um, we also need to hear him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, tough one, but of course, uh, yeah, several considerations to bear in mind. Well, we've often asked you to participate on the show, and of course, we gladly welcome your questions. You can tweet us, uh, Portfolio Watch, uh, using that particular hashtag, and at CNBC Africa, or email us, Portfolio Watch, at abn360.com. We've gotten just one question from McDonald. Let's actually address it now. Well, an interesting one, as we've asked you to participate on the show, McDonald Molusi actually tweeted us uh, asking a question, what causes a portfolio manager to sell a stock and how does one decide when? Very interesting one and quite pertinent, especially given the amount of volatility we've highlighted on the show. But Andrew, from an old mutual private client securities wealth point of view, what's the deciding factor? <laughs> I think 
you know, deciding when to, to sell is probably even more important than deciding when to buy. I think it's incredibly important to have a strong sell discipline. Um, but, you know, there's a number of factors that might cause a portfolio manager to decide to sell a stock. The best, you know, the, what you're really looking for is that the share's done really well mm -hmm. and it's hit to what you believe is fair value or even gone past its fair value and you think it's become expensive. Yeah. And I suppose that's probably the best case scenario that you want to sell. You know, you might want to sell when it's done exactly the opposite, and you can take mm -hmm. St Steinhoff as an example. Sure. So as soon as the bad news broke, we took the decision to, to get out there and then, because typically it just, you know, keeps drifting lower. And that's probably the worst case scenario that you're selling for a really bad reason. You know, but, and there could be a, a number of other things. It could be opportunity costs, so you might see a better you know, opportunity elsewhere. So you've got capital locked up in stock A, but you think stock B is going to do better. So you might just do a straight switch. It could be a quality issue uh, around management, around the balance sheets, you know, around the industry, geography, whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a numerous, you know, and then it could also be a change in strategy. You know, management might say one thing which you believe in, and then they're going to do something, something completely different. Yeah. And in that case, it might cause you to, to walk away. So I think there's, there's no real silver bullet, you know, in terms of this is the reason. There's a whole myriad yeah. of reasons. Mm. Tough call. Aileen, yes. very briefly from your point of view. Um, I think a bad capital allocation decision. Mm. So we were invested in AXA earlier this year, which was a French insurer and financial services company. And they announced they were going to acquire a very large property and casualty insurance company. So not directly complementary to the business. The risk profile was much different, in fact, riskier. They were paying a 33% premium for sure. it. Um, so if you're overpaying for a, an asset that's not likely to be synergistic to your business, but yet management says, yes, there are great synergies to be derived from this merger, we would probably say, well, you know what? We don't like that capital allocation decision, not good for shareholders, and that would prompt us to sell. Okay. And then governance issues. So MTN, when the first um, fines broke, or the news of the fines, we, you know, MTN had broken the law in Nigeria, and we took the decision. We, if you break the law, that's a governance issue and a cultural issue at the time at MTN, so we sold. Many considerations to certainly bear in mind, and I think it's, as you said, Andrew, one of the uh, tougher decisions uh, before actually deciding when to invest in a stock. But if you'd like to be like McDonald, please do feel free to send us your details and emails uh, on the uh, details listed on screen. Tweet us or send us an email, and we'll glad you, gladly address many of your investment questions. In the meantime, though, a big thank you to both my guests, Andrew Dittburner from Old Mutual Wealth Private Client Securities and Aileen Campbell from AdviceWorks. Until next time, though... Take care and we'll see you on Portfolio Watch.